Okay. Welcome. And we're going to get started with a snippet. Now the snippet may not have anything to do, may not have anything to do with the rest of the lesson, and it probably doesn't with this one. But it's something that I learned and wanted to share with you guys. So take out the paper that I left on your table. The problem is I didn't send it so that these people got it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the verse addresses and you go to First Peter. So the verse addresses are, just write them down, Two, chapter 2, verse 19. You have them, but these people don't. So I have ah, to just ah, say. Ah. So I have, to, I, I have to, yes, I have to connect with these people online. So it's chapter 2, verse 19. But Barbara, you, you have a sheet with... No, the people online. Online. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm talking. <laughs> I didn't realize I you were recording just now. <laughs> yes. I thought you did that in the morning. Start again. <laughs> okay. Chapter 2, 19 and 20. Chapter 3, 13. Chapter 3, 17 to 18. Chapter 4, 1 to 2. Chapter 4, 12 to 13. Chapter 4, 15 to 16, and chapter 5, 9, and 10. Okay. What we're going to do, what I want you to do at home, and what I want you two people to do, a few people to do, is to read it out loud, these verses. I want you to find the common word, the word that is in all of these verses. And, second, I, I want you to underline you at home, so you're going to circle the common word, then you're going to underline uh, whatever has to do with Christ's suffering. So, underline on your paper, in your Bible, whatever has to do with Christ's sufferings. Circle the common word and underline. Okay. So, and you know what I want you to do. Read it out loud to each other. So, how about if I have Margaret and Donna read it to each other? Well, you four read, you three read. That'll, that'll be fine. That'll be fine. Okay? Come in, come in. For this fine, she's here. Okay. Oh, we have a babysitter here for those of you online. In the afternoon, the one o'clock session is uh, there is a babysitter that comes, and so uh, we have moms who have children. So if you know of anybody who has children who would like to attend the one o'clock one, really it's the twelve forty-five. I'm talking to the people online. <laughs> so get started with your papers. And uh, Betty Ann, uh, you sit with Kay, Karen, and Kay. Go. For this one favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, thus embarrass us under sorrow and suffering on God's Here, the children, can you? For what credit is there if we will be quiet and are harshly treated momentarily? Go ahead. I'm talking to these and, people. And you endure it with patience. <laughs> but if when you do what is right and suffer, you endure it with patience. Okay. But if when you do, um, but if you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. Three thirteen. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for what for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Therefore, since Christ has suffered here in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has come from sinful living to cease. So as we live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for what is of men, but for the will of God. For the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Beloved, be not 
Uh, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes yes. upon you for your testing, for at, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree you that you share for with doing what is right, suffering, for doing what is wrong. So the sufferings of Christ, oh, the sufferings of Christ keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with the exaltation. Well, come in, come in. Here, welcome sure to the that none of you suffers as a murderer. Then he quickly preached through, through those verses because we're going to be discussing this. Yeah. Christian, who is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. 5, 9, 10. But resist the devil, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So, you got it? Okay. Well, it was very obvious, wasn't it? What's the word that's common in all those verses throughout First Peter? <laughs> Suffering. Right. And uh, you either have been suffering, you are suffering, or you will suffer. <laughs> I'm telling you that. Because that's what uh, it ha happens. Now we n have a reason for it. There's always purpose. I love being a Christian. Because no matter what happens, there's purpose. You know, the world doesn't have a purpose for the bad things that happen. They are clueless, and they have no hope. But we have a hope. Because our suffering has a purpose. Uh, we may not know it immediately or ever, but it's purposeful. So now, uh, we, we underlined, uh, uh, we circled that, and we uh, underlined the words that have to do with Christ's suffering. So let's get into the text itself. Uh, by the way, what do you know is the theme of First Peter? Bingo! <laughs> now... If you're suffering, what book are you going to go to? First Peter. Of course. Because First Peter, the, the theme of First Peter is that suffering that these people are going through. And, and, and he's giving purpose behind it. Okay. So now, I will, this is the only question I'm not going to give you the answer as at a verse address. Because I want you to skim through it again and figure out what verse tells us that a test must meet God's approval before it can reach us. Now, that is so important because when we're going through the test, listen up, when we're going through the test, we need to know that it went through God's loving fingers first before it came to us. He put his okay, his John Hancock, on that test you're going through. What verse tells us that? Which of those verses? 317. 317. Well, what in that verse tells you? You're right. You got it. What what tells you that it has to go? If God should will it. Right. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer. How? Or what? For what? Doing what is right. Really get this because he keeps going over this fact several times, doesn't he? It has to be for the right reason. If you're suffering because you got yourself into a big hole, it has different things that you need to uh, um, think about. But here, okay. Now, we underlined the things that had to do with Christ, right? So now, what does Christ have to do with our suffering? What does the text say? Which text tells us? 3, 17 and 18, for Christ also died for our sins once for all. Yep. So we have that for Christ. What's another one? That has to do with Christ. Sharing the suffering. Oh, that's it. Okay. Okay. This is a big one. Okay. Here's us, sufferer. Here, Christ, sufferer. Right? Just like that? 
We're attached to him? No, he's sharing. We're sharing. You see the difference? We are sharing in his suffering when we suffer. What a high calling. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing in his suffering. It's not this. It's not this. It's not this. It's this. I'm sharing. So when you're going through, you're not alone. You have somebody who's been there who is there right now. We share in his suffering. Okay. Um, did you notice in 4, 1, and 2 that uh, what is the result in verses 4, 1, and 2, what is the result uh, of the person who suffers in the See, flesh? Cease from sinful living. Right. He ceased from the Now, you've read the other verses. Is it just any Christian sufferer? And we're talking about Christians now. Okay? Not the world, but Christians. Is it any Christian sufferer ceases from sinful living? What have we learned from the other verses? The person suffering for the sake of righteousness. Okay. It, it's got to be he's suffering for the sake of righteousness. You've done the right. Somebody else has done the wrong. You've done the right. Somebody else has done the wrong. Okay? Now, what's the other thing? For the will of God. Okay. Yes, we're doing it because of the will of God. Yep. What else has to be there? How must we suffer? As a Christian. Okay, as a Christian. Good. As a Christian. There's another little thing. That if we don't have it, we become bitter, even as Christians. What is it? We must suffer how? What does the text say? Rejoicing. <laughs> okay, what does the text say? Where, where are you finding? Unjustly. Okay, it has to be for just reason. We, that's good. Keep on, on 4, 12, 13. Keep on rejoicing for the author of Revelation. Glory, you may rejoice. Yeah, okay. Patiently. Bingo. <clears throat> Bingo. 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 God. <laughs> patiently patiently because if we don't do it patiently what's going to whelm up and maybe overwhelm us as a Christian even anger, bitterness yeah anger, bitterness, why me self pity we, we just, it's, this is difficult but what, we have to do it for a just reason and we have to do it patiently, don't we? Because if we don't do it patiently, we don't cease from <laughs> we don't cease from sinful living. There's no guarantee. I don't understand what that means. Okay. To cease from sinful living. Yeah. What what happens when we have our whole concentration on dealing with things patiently before the Lord? What happens to everything else in life? Sinful things in life, even. Just falls by the wayside, doesn't it? Because we're concentrating on that, that Lord who, who suffers with us. The rest of, let me give you an example. I can't tell you how dramatically my daughter changed through her suffering. Mm -hmm. She became, now she was becoming, she was doing really well as a Christian. She was walking with the Lord. Dramatic change when she learned that she was, had cancer and when life became very fragile for her. And the, that fleshly thing that was a part of her life began to fall away because she was concentrating on the Lord. And as time passed, she got better had suffering and leaving the flesh behind. Um, what happens to you when you're suffering? Where does your concentration go? Patiently looking at the one who said, I'm okaying this. I'm okaying this. 
And the other things seem to fall away, don't they? Yeah. Okay. Who else do you share your sufferings with? We talked about Christ, but who else do you share your sufferings with? Yeah, yeah. We we saw there's others out there suffering. I've given you this example before. I had a friend who talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked about her father who had died about a year before, and I could feel compassion for her. She just loved her father, and I knew she needed to talk about him, and I listened. <laughs> But I felt nothing for her like I felt when my father died. Mm -hmm. When my father died, then how did my, it exponentially widened my compassion for a daughter who loses their father. There are people in my church who have lost a daughter. <laughs> we suffer together. We pray for each other. We encourage each other. Don't we? We suffer with others. Others are suffering. Looking at others suffering, we share with them a common bond. Don't we? Not only do we share a common bond with Jesus and we share in his suffering, but we share a common bond with other sufferers. They're suffering. And so what can we do better because we've been suffering? Comfort, soul, Comfort, counsel. Console, counsel. What's another biggie? Pray. Bingo, Jackie. I can pray. I pray so much more sincerely for people who are going through suffering because I've suffered. Okay. Where does Peter say suffering comes from? In verse 5 9. The devil? Huh. Doesn't it say that? Some of our suffering comes from the devil himself. Now, God has okayed it. Where did the suffering of Job come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Did God okay it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's what he's saying here. Some of our suffering comes from the devil. He just does not. He's the wicked one, the evil one, who goes around like a roaring lion. And he's ready to pounce on any Christian. But he won't. Unless God says, yep, go ahead. This one I want to test. So God can't cause our suffering. It's impossible for him to... I'm not going into that theological <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> I'm just pointing out what the, uh, the scripture says right now. Okay. This scripture says that some of our suffering comes from the devil. Some of our suffering. <laughs> yeah. Some of our suffering comes from our own hands. Right. right. Yeah. But it's allowed by God the Father. Well, here, can I ask you, uh, it says, but if when you do what is right and suffer for it, would that... Um, you patiently, um, for it, you patiently endure it to find favor with God. Is this just speaking that you find favor with God when you're doing a Christian act? I think it's when you're patiently enduring. Okay. You see that? Do you see the connection? Yeah, but I'm just wondering if it's like you're patiently enduring, like you're witnessing and you're being... Yeah, you're patiently enduring when you keep going. And do the right thing, whether you feel like it or not. Because when you're suffering, what's the last thing you want to do? Anything but look at yourself, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Poor me. Yeah, I believe me. It's easy to look at our own problems. Mm -hmm. I know it. And beside, you know, I don't, I don't want to teach. I'm hurting too bad. I don't want to do this good act. I'm hurting too bad. I don't want to do what is right. I'm hurting too bad. Okay. There's our snippet. 
And I, I just love, you know, I was just, um, I love those verses. I, I just love the fact that we have a whole book on suffering. And one of them is First Peter, but another one is Lamentations. Guys, okay. excuse my, I have to take this off. Got warm. Okay, we're going to kind of review what we learned the first week. Um, but what we're going to do is show different examples. So it's not going to be a repetition, really. It's going to be a whole new lesson, but teach the same things we did before. So, excuse me? Oh. Okay. And one of the words we learned the last time was the word selectivity. Remember that? Oh, uh, were, were, were Karen, Karen, and Kay able to watch the YouTube? Or I shouldn't ask you. Don't Never mind. Ask. Don't ask. That's right, your computer doesn't work right. Well, guess what? You won't have to worry about not hearing the first week's lesson because you're going to get it again, only with all new examples. So, here's what we learned. That there's selectivity going on with the author, with any author of any book. But in particular now, we're learning about selectivity in the Gospels. And so uh, everything is purposefully written and theologically centered. And what do I mean by theologically centered or oriented? It always teaches us something about God. Who's the main character of every single book, every single story, every single psalm in the Bible? Who's the main character? God. God. That should change our way of thinking about anything that we read from the text. Because when we go to Exodus, we're not learning about Moses primarily. That's a side benefit we learn about Moses. Who are we learning about? God. Okay. What is one thing we can ask ourselves of any text that we ever read? What is this teaching me about God? What is this teaching me about God? And so when we come to the, the text concerning uh, Zacharias, which we did la uh, the last time we were together, we had Zacharias. That's the first story in Luke's Bible. So there are some people who weren't here the last time, so you're going to educate them. And what was uh, um, uh, the theme that was introduced in the book of Luke from the first story, the story about Zacharias. Prayer. Bingo. Prayer. Now, let me tell you something. How do, or ask you something, how do we know that Luke's book is going to be all about prayer? Just from that first story. What was in that first story, of, uh, and you can look in your Bible, um, I think it's Luke chapter 1, verse 5 it starts with. How do you know that it's going to be about Luke, uh, about prayer, sorry, from Luke 1? Uh, Luke 1, verse 5. Luke 1, verse 5. I was right. What's going on in Luke 1, verse 5? We're in what building? In Luke 1. Hey, we're in the temple. What's going on outside? Right outside the holy place where Zacharias is. Okay, there's prayer because it tells us the people were praying outside. What's going on inside that reminds us of prayer? Incense being burned. Incense being burned. Three times we're told about the altar of the incense in those few verses. What does incense have to do with prayer? Up right, and, and and what's the uh, the physical uh, appearance of uh, that smoke? smoke. And so, as smoke rises, how what is that related to? Our uh, prayer. Okay, how many times does Luke mention the altar of incense? In that, yeah, in that story, how many times did we say? And I just gave you the answer before. <laughs> you say three times. Good. Karen got it. Okay. Three times. So we have 
it's, it tells us that the people who were outside the holy place, what were they doing? Praying. Right. Right. Then it says uh, that um, whose prayer was being answered? Who does the Gabriel say his prayer or petition is being answered? Zacharias. Zacharias. And then three times, so I, uh, we have mention of the altar of incense where smoke is going up because of the burning. And so five times we're kind of introduced to the idea of prayer. Now, do you remember one of the things that I we, we had to read? What, what book did we read the introduction to the last time? Remember that? Pride and Prejudice. Right. Now, I don't know if you guys read Pride and Prejudice. I know. That's the one book, very few books that I read over and over again, but I read that one. Good. And it starts out, those famous saying, you know, that uh, the whole reason for a rich man to come to a certain town was to get a wife. And so everybody in the town lays claim to this rich man because he's got to marry somebody in that town. So that's how it starts out. So what's the rest of the book about? <laughs> yeah, rich man getting a wife that he didn't know he needed. <laughs> okay, so, so when you have an introduction to a, a book in the Bible, it's going to lay out what the rest of the book is going to be about, right? So, we have laid out an introduction. What's the rest of the book going to be about? Prayer. 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 Okay. And the theological pr uh, a truth that we learned from that. Does anybody remember the theological truth we learned from all this prayer, 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 prayer? <laughs> but how about in that text? That, that is right, because that's what we're going to come to the conclusion over and over to that point. But God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Whose prayer did he answer right at that time? Hmm? Zacharias. Zacharias's prayer. What prayer was that? For a, child. For a child. Now, we don't know when Zacharias started that prayer or when he ended it. But he may not have been praying it right at that moment, <laughs> at his age. <laughs> but God was answering it. What other prayer was being answered? The, the people. Good, good, good. And what was that, Donna? Mm -hmm. Prayer for the Messiah. Prayer for the Messiah to come. Where they're waiting, waiting, <clears throat> waiting for all the Old Testament promises to get fulfilled. They're waiting. And at, so Luke says prayer. And then the fulfillment of that prayer. And so what does he link prayer to? God answers prayer. That's the theological teaching of that book. Now, uh, so Luke has selected prayer. He uses it for, th we, t we talked about three different ways. The first way was that he will record that Jesus prays before major decisions or major events. You're going to see that in Luke even when other gospel writers don't record these prayers or that Jesus was praying, Luke is going to record it. Let me give you an example of Luke doing a, a prayer before a major decision uh, or event and, um, and that other gospel writers don't even record it. So let's go to Luke chapter 11, one, uh, verses 1 to 4. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Is that in our paper or is it? Oh, this is me. <laughs> you don't have it on your papers. I'm sorry. Not this one. I'm just giving you an example so that uh, when you do the paper, which is next, you're going to be doing on your own, you're going to see how to do this. So Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. And it goes on. Right? So, the Lord's Prayer follows 
what is Jesus doing? Praying. 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 Let's go to Matthew and look at it from Matthew's point of view. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 9. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, dot, dot, dot. Look before it. Is Jesus praying? No, he's in the middle of a hole. Yes. He's talking about prayer right now. He's not praying. And, 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 right, right. He's talking about prayer, but he's not praying, is he? Bingo. <laughs> Why not? It wasn't important to his story. <laughs> it wasn't important for his story. Now, is prayer important to Matthew? Yes. In fact, his rendition of the Lord's Prayer is more extensive than Luke's. And he does mention prayer at various times. But it is not his theme. So he's going to select not to record that event that Jesus prayed. It's just not. It's going to be important for Luke to record that. Because his theme through the book is going to be praying, Jesus prays, therefore we should pray. When they did this, they did this purposefully oh. or God just led them in that direction? Bingo. Either one. Sounds okay. good. Because they purposefully do what God wills for his, in his word. But are they aware? Yeah, that's what I am guess. Like that's what I meant. Aware. Are they? Yeah. 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 I think so. Yeah. It's very purposeful. You see it over and over again. Purposefulness. Okay. So now, uh, let's come to the next page. And notice what I omitted. Not purposefully, though. I omitted page numbers. <laughs> Remember? Um, didn't I tell you last time was a fluke? I <laughs> told you. Last time was a fluke. Because what happens is I forget. But that's not purposeful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The so next page is called Luke and Prayer Compared to Other Gospels. So we're going to see this same thing going on. The selectivity of Luke. Making sure we have prayer. So what I want you to do as you're going back and forth and, and reading this is underline the word prayer. In both columns. So now, listen up. All I want you to do is read Luke 3, 21, then go to the other column and read Matthew. You're not going to do... Whoops. Are you on Luke and prayer compared to other Gospels? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Good. Does anybody need it? Because I have an extra copy. We're, We're doing well. Right. Okay. <laughs> We're great. You know what? I forget your first name. Jackie. Jackie. Jackie gave me a copy. Is it? Oh, okay. Jackie, thank you, because I'll need copies tonight, and those will be it. Um, oh, good. Great. Um, what we will... Okay. We are only going to do the top two stories right now, this minute. So Luke 3 and Matthew 3. I want you to read them, underline prayer in those columns. Go ahead. Uh, you four, you, and, uh, and, and do this five, because... No, it's, it's every lesson begins with Luke 3. No, it's all right. It's Luke, it says at the top, Luke and prayer compared to other Gospels. Maybe she doesn't have it. She has it. We have the whole 71 pages. <laughs> <laughs> That's Luke in columns. Okay? It's Luke and prayer compared to other Gospels. No. It's not in the columns part. It's in your syllabus for today. Is it in there? Is it in there? I have another one. Here we go. That's, that's your columns, looking columns. You want to have this. Okay? Now you, you don't have, here's your, that's not the right one. Wow. So, let me give you a whole one. 
You're going to read out loud to each other, Luke 3 and Matthew 3, just those two. I want you to circle prayer in each one of the two columns. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and the voice came out of heaven. He won my beloved son, and you are in my place. Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John, to be baptized by him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and light lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, by whom I am well pleased. <coughs> What's missing in Matthew? Prayer. What's there? What has been selected by Luke to record? Prayer. Remember? Major events, uh, major decisions are always preceded by prayer. Always. Selectivity. Let's look at the next one. This is the transfiguration. Let's do it again. Read what it says in Luke. Underlining prayer. Luke 9, 28 through 36. And eight days after the sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mount to pray. And while he was praying, the spirit of his face became different, and his clothing became white and lightning flashes. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with them. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Mark, yes. And you're going to compare the two. I'm sorry, I should have made sure. Luke 9 and Mark 9. And it came in the light, as no longer was drawn up, and what more than Elijah appeared to him along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Elijah appeared to him along with Moses. What did you know? What did you know? No prayer in Mark. No prayer in Mark, but prayer in Luke. Mm -hmm. At the Transfiguration, you would have found the same thing in Matthew. Matthew leaves out any reference to Jesus praying. Why is Luke recording it? What does he want us to know? Prayer is important. Yeah, prayer is important. That's good work. But prayer preceded what? A major event. A major event or decision, yes, in his book. But it, was it restricted to that? No. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think he recorded it, though, that we would learn what? About Jesus Christ. That we need to pray yeah. before a major event. Yeah, yeah that we need to. It's a, yeah, yeah. Now, look, look at the next page. In fact, continues it. And what do, you, what do you see on the left side and the right side? You don't see anything on the right side. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that one that only has one column on it. It's only on the left side. Yeah. There we go. So now we have, and 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 what I what I'm going to do is um, have you read the top. I'm going to read the top one to you while you read it silently to yourself. And I want you to 
find out um, some things. So listen very carefully and read very carefully and circle pray, prayer. Now, he was telling them a parable. What is the major way that Matthew gets across what he needed to say uh, in his book? What was one major technique that he used? Yes. Parables. Mm -hmm. Luke's telling a, a recording a parable. But it's non-existent, this parable, in Matthew. And yet Matthew is proficient in retelling parables, isn't he? Okay. He was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while, he was unwilling. But afterwards, he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Okay. What's con now, right before, at verse 6, we have, we have, one, we have 1 to 6, a parable. And then questioning at, concerning the elect in the next verses. Okay, what is common about both of those sections? What is common about the widow concerning the widow praying or crying out to this judge and the elect? What's common about those two stories? Persistent prayer. Okay, uh, they're both <laughs> persistent. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the widow isn't persistent in prayer. She's just persistent because she's not praying. Okay. What else? They're both persistent. They're both crying out to a judge. They're both crying out to a judge. One is a physical here on earth judge. The other is the Lord. Right? Okay. What else? They need justice. Both need justice. Right. What's and different? Delay in answer. Okay, that's what's different. There's a delay in the first one. What does what does the Lord do? His his is going to be quick. Right. Yeah, quick. What else is different? Well, Jesus is doing it because he loves us, and, and the judge is doing it because he okay. has okay. Is there a relationship between this woman and her judge? No, no relationship at all. In the book of Luke, there's the relationship that is primary between the father and his child. And that's what he's showing here. There was no relationship mm -hmm. up there. There was a relationship between the father and his child, the elect isn't there? Big, big difference. Because that is the difference between the book of Luke and just about the, the three other books. This relationship thing, it's not just about prayer in Luke. It's about the relationship of the father with his child. And so we have brought out, here's a relationship, and God hears. What does prayer have to do with faith? I love, Luke just inserts these things and you think, oh, where'd that come from? We've been talking about prayer. How does he conclude this, this parable about prayer? Will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on the earth? How is prayer related to faith? An evidence of faith. It is. It's a mirror image of our faith. It's it comes from our faith. So what's he saying about people at the end times 
when he returns? What is he fearful of? Nobody will be praying. Nobody will be praying. Will he find faith? Right. And the faith, because if we have faith, what will we do? Pray. In order to pray correctly, what do we need? Relationship. Relationship and faith. 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 Relationship and faith. So when he says that, he's saying, ah, am I going to find any prayers on this earth when I can't return? Now, what did that mean about prayer at that time? That was a, it was an illustration of faith. Yes. But what did it tell us about prayer and the people of Jesus' day? That's a better question. They pray. No, I think that there weren't many pray prayers. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what's going on, that he's, he's worried he's seeing that there aren't many prayers then, because he has to keep going over this prayer thing, doesn't he? He has to even teach the disciples how to pray. And, and, and then he says, you know, am I even going to find it in the end times? So how important then is prayer to Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. And we're no better than those people back then. Because I'm not sure how our prayers, our prayer life is. Let me, let me give you something that somebody gave the bulk of our prayer should not be like a visit to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Somebody brought that out this morning, and I wrote it right down. Everybody else wrote it down. The bulk of our prayer should not be like a visit to the emergency room. But that's the bulk of our prayer, isn't it? Well, back then, when they, when, they, when they had the call to, you know, to pray, they had the... They had the and they had to pray. They had what, to pray. What, what, was, but they were road prayers. Or road prayers. prayers, because what does Jesus say? Will yeah. I find right. faith? faith. Right. So just, an integral part of praying, right. kind of prayers <laughs> that the Father hears, are those prayers that they write from faith. faith. That's yeah. what Jesus is saying. From your heart. Right. From your heart. And it has to do with relationship, 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 relationship with the Father. We as children, with the Father. That's what our prayers should be about. Now, um, Luke 18, uh, 9 to 14. Let, let's look at that one. And what, I want you to answer this question. What is prerequisite, a prerequisite for answered prayer? And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. What's a prerequisite for answer prayer? The humility. humility. The humility. Can you imagine the audience hearing this? They're used to seeing these Pharisees go around and almost in front of everybody praying out loud their prayers. And then we have a tax collector, the hated sinner. And he's acceptable to the Lord. Why? Because he's humble. Do you see how Luke uses Jesus' parables to get across his main theme, which is prayer. prayer and that relationship between God and his children? Okay, so these parables are not in any of the other Gospels. Right, right. 
That's why it's blank on the right-hand side. <laughs> Do you know how hard that was to get that lined up <laughs> so that we saw prayer, the, the parables on the one side but not on the other? It was difficult. So, okay, the second reason, way prayer is used in Scripture is like a framing mechanism, technique, uh, bookends. Okay, that is the page that says Luke and prayer. Luke is known as the evangelist of prayer. Do you see that? Luke and prayer. Luke is known as the evangelist of prayer. Uh, that's a little bit far. Okay, you go, went one page too far. So go back to Luke and prayer. Luke is known as the evangelist of prayer. We're not in the book of Luke. I know some of you have the book of Luke in columns. We're not in that. How about the, the syllabus that I sent this week? Do you have that? Yeah, you don't want Luke in columns. Yeah. You want the Bible study for 9-26-13. If you don't have it, I do. I don't know why that would have been. Yes. And then Luke in prayer. There we go. Karen, one for you. I don't know how you got the, uh, I didn't send that. There we go. Okay. And you knew how it was like to the paper. Oh, good. Okay. Luke and prayer. No, it, it needs to be Luke. Uh, this one, right? No, Luke and prayer. Luke is known as the evangelist of prayer. Next page. Mm -hmm. Luke okay. and prayer. Luke number one? Uh, that's before you already went through these two. I don't want you to mess them out of the way. So that's done. And that's the next. Great. Okay. I told you, if you can get used to all the papers, you've got half of <laughs> the hard times with uh, my Bible lesson. So it's Luke and prayer. Luke is known as the evangelist of prayer. Do you have that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. He uses prayer as a framing device. Yes, he uses prayer to teach us that Jesus uh, prays immediately before uh, major events or decisions, uh, even when other uh, gospel writers don't record that Jesus prayed. The second thing is, Jesus uses it, or Luke uses prayer for a, a uh, as bookends, framing device. So let's look at that. We have uh, at the top Luke 1 and then Luke 24. That's the beginning and the end, the very end of Luke. We have the beginning. And the end. So what I want you to do is read those two to each other and find out what is common about both of them that shows that Luke is using it as a frame around or bookends around the whole book. Go ahead. Read out loud. At the temple, now it happened that while Zacharias was performing his priestly service before God, he was chosen by God to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. The burning incense represented the prayers of the people, as in Psalm 40, 14, 141, 2, Revelation 5, 8, 8, 3, and 4. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside. And read the one next to it. At the ascension and at the temple, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy. What is common? What is common about those two? Temple. What? Yeah. Okay, good. You're getting it. What is common about these two uh, texts? One from the beginning of Luke, one from the end of Luke. What's your answer? What's common? The temple. Temple. What else is common? Prayer. 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 Now, how do we know that they're praying in the last story of the book? They were blessing God. Right. Worship. Yep. 
blessing, worshiping. That's all a part of prayer. So at the very beginning and at the very end of the book, it's prayer. You see how he has framed his book with prayer so that when we read what is inside, what are we going to be, um, what's going to affect us? What, what are we going to know this book is about within? Prayer. Prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Let's go to the next one. The Gethsemane scene. I want you to read that back and forth to each other also. This is the beginning of the scene and the end of the scene at Gethsemane. Luke 22, 31 to 40. And Jesus proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Luke 22, when Jesus rose from 45, he came to the disciples. At the family, when Jesus rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. and sorrow, and he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. First thing I want to ask you uh, before we get into it is, why are we not surprised that the disciples were sleeping here? Okay, good. You've read it. What happened at the Transfiguration? Uh, yeah, they're sleeping from. Yeah. What happened at the Transfiguration? Bingo. Yeah, Jesus was praying. They were sleeping. We're not surprised that this is happening. What does that tell us about the disciples? You're just like God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were yeah. taking their red vitamins. Right. <laughs> and and let me give you a little hint. When you're really tired and you you have it, you have to really pray about something. I would suggest walking around. <laughs> it helps me. Praying out loud helps me to keep my attention on prayer. You you have to trick the brain <laughs> because the brain wants to go in hibernation. As soon as you sit down, as soon as you start to pray. It wants to go into hibernation. Okay, what was the same about these bookends? It's almost exactly the same exact words. What are the words? Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And pray that you not enter into temptation. Okay, now did they pray, that is? No. So what happened when they entered into temptation? They Okay, they fell asleep. What happens and what happens afterwards when Jesus is taken? Right, they fell away. They ran, ran, hid. Ran, hid. Were they able to face temptation? No, they weren't. Why not? Why does Luke say they were, what does Luke say was the reason for them running away and not being able to conquer temptation? They didn't pray. They didn't pray. Pray, 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 pray. Right, right, right. It's a part of life. Who does, now, well, I don't have it written here, so remember the book ends. Uh, pray that you don't enter into temptation. Pray that you don't enter into temptation. Who does Jesus pray to in between? Do you remember? It's God, the Lord. So, father. His Father. Mm. His Father. Right? You know, Abba, Father. It, Luke doesn't record Abba, but Father, take away this cup. It's too much for me. I don't want it. See what? What? Why? Why Father? Why Father? Relationship. Relationship. That is what Luke is trying to get across in his book. It's not just prayer. It's the prayer of relationship, the father to the child. Father to the child. Let's look at the crucifixion. The last one down. And even though I mentioned it the last time, I want you to see it. Okay? Go ahead and read to each other. At the crucifixion, when they came to the place called the crucifixion, there they crucified him and the criminals. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This is the very beginning of the crucifixion. 
the very end of the crucifixion. What do you notice about the two that forms a, an inclusio around it? Prayer to the Father. Prayer to the Father. What's that word we keep saying? Relationship. Relationship. Okay. What's happening in between? Do you remember? Suffering. Yes, suffering. What are people doing? The soldiers. What are Mocking. they doing? Mocking. Mocking. Saying to him, what should he do? What, what are they telling him to do? Come down. Come down. What would we call that? Taunting. Taunting? Tempting. Tempting. How's he able to defeat the enemy? Prayer. 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 And not even prayer for himself so much. He's, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But he's praying. That's what gives him according to Luke, the ability to resist temptation. Because Luke has already primed us for that, hasn't he? Mm. At Gethsemane. He says, pray that you don't enter into temptation. Mm. Let's pray. A relationship to the Father. A relationship. Now, I want to show you one more thing. So go to the next page. Because Luke is going to demonstrate prayer. So the third thing, now the first thing was uh, that uh, Luke uses prayer to show us that Jesus prays before major events or decisions, uh, even when other gospel writers don't record this prayer. Uh, the second thing is Luke uses prayer as a bookend so that we can read what's in between uh, educationally, we, we, with, with understanding. He wants us to read what's in between with understanding with these bookends. The third thing is Luke will show Jesus as a prayer, and this is disciples, and we will become prayers, those who pray. Jesus is a prayer. He's one who prays. Therefore, we need to be prayers, ones who pray. So, I want you to read Luke 10, 38 to 11, 2. These are two stories that if you were in a Sunday school class, you would, lose, use, uh, you would uh, teach the one story at one sitting and the other stu- story at the other sitting and uh, avoid the context. We're not doing that here. What I have done was show you that one story in Luke leads into the other story of Luke. They're juxtaposed for a purpose. That's why I have you uh, um, uh, with Luke in columns, so that you can see that one story leads into the next, which leads into the next, which leads into the next, which leads into the next. That's why I have it in columns. You can see it better that way. When you have Luke in columns, which you all seem to have down there. (laughs) I I I (laughs) Okay, so what I want you to do is find the reason for these two stories being juxtaposed. So go ahead and uh, read it to each other. And discuss, why are these two stories juxtaposed, put side by side? Why are they connected in this way? Oh, sure. Uh, oh, I forgot you were part of our group. Luke 10, 34 through 11, 2. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted by all the preparation, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which has not been taken away from her. And it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Mm-hmm. When you 
think that those two stories should be disconnected and put in one lesson and then another lesson. Wouldn't you think that that's the way you're supposed to do it? Well, that's what our Sunday school material does, doesn't it? But <laughs> Luke puts them side by side for a reason, because he wants us to interconnect them. So, okay, what, what is the connection between those two? The relationship. Good, good word. Good word. And what's the relationship that is going on in the first story? Mary and Jesus. Jesus. What would you say was going on there? She was listening intently to him, and, and like it was like almost a form of worship. Yeah. Um, okay. What else, Kay? Did, oh, I thought I saw you take a breath. That's usual, <laughs> the usual way of somebody <laughs> looking well, like they're ready to. Teaching in both. Right. Okay. So what about the fact that, do you, I mean, we always think of Mary as uh, just sitting there listening. Mm -hmm. And that's good. But what else do you think is going on here? What if a friend came to your house? What would you do between the two of you? You would be what? Talking. 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 Good. Do you think Mary talked in this? I think there was conversation going on between the two of them. Does not relegate the conversation mainly to Jesus, does it? They're together. They're together. Okay, so now they're together, and so that gives, it moves right into the next scene, which is what is going on in the next scene. Between Jesus and his disciples, relationship. Relationship again. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, as Mary sat as, at Jesus' feet, mm -hmm. But what is going on between between Mary's thing and Jesus with his disciples? T Jesus teaching his disciples about prayer. What's going on first? What's in between? What's Jesus, Jesus doing? Praying. He's praying. So Jesus first is praying, right? So he's having a conversation with who? His father. His father. And so the next step is, well, okay, let's back up. The conversation between, the first step was the conversation between Jesus and Mary. Mary. Next step, the conversation between Jesus and his father. His father. Next step, the conversation between Jesus and Jesus. And, and the, the well, disciples. and, disciples. yes, but what's he teaching on? Prayer. 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 So it's the conversation between, the Our Father is a conversation between. The disciples and the Father. So, conversation between Mary and Jesus flows into a conversation between Jesus and the Father, which flows into a conversation between the disciples and the Father, which then ultimately flows into a conversation between whom? Us and the Father. And the Father. You see? Okay. Conversation between Jesus and Martha. <laughs> well, is that the conversation that should be going on? No, we, we see that. What's the, the conversation that ought to be going on? That Jesus is demonstrating goes on between him and the mm -hmm. Father. See how the one story affects the next so that we see what our conversation should look like. Sitting at the feet of the Father, conversing with him. Right? Isn't that a beautiful picture? And Martha's also like, she's not focusing on Jesus. She's focusing on somebody on. else. And she's worried and bothered about what that other person is doing. Right, right. Do you ever pray like that? Lord, look what they're doing. Yes. Look what they're doing to me. Help me. Yes. <laughs> yes. It, and you know what? It, Martha, was, it was all about her. Yes. And Mary, it was all about oh, Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Do you see how it's a good demonstration of what yeah. our prayer life ought to be look like? It's great. We learn one more thing about John the Baptist in this little scene, don't we? What is it? John the Baptist. 
Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Now, now, why does Luke select to put this bit of information that John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray mm -hmm. right here, rather than at the beginning when we were introduced to John? We're not even told that about John, but Luke selects mm -hmm. to put it right here. Why? John taught his I, Yeah. So, yeah. What, what John, we want you to, Jesus teaching us. Yeah. What to do. Right. Just ask John the Baptist. So we know something about John the Baptist. What was he? Right. Right. See? Now, which leads us to the ultimate question. Question. Are we prayers? <laughs> what is our prayer life like? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you for your word that opens wide new thoughts about you, that lets us know that you want a relationship with us, that you want to have a conversation with us. So help us to be like Mary. Sit at your feet conversing with you. In Christ's precious name, amen. Okay, guys, you did a great job. And now I don't know what to do with this. Great job. Stop.